Right, the focus of my presentation today is on how a tiny city state that the UN has classified to be extremely water stressed has over the last 30 years overcome our water challenges. All right. I will forgive you if you can't identify where Singapore is, so I have uh, <coughs> brought it up. Um, and what is Singapore challenge? We are the densest country in the world, right? So you cannot compare Singapore with other cities like New York, Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok. Because we are a country as well as a city. We don't have a huge hinterland that can support the city in terms of water supply, energy, food. So what you see is what you get. We are 5.5 million in population, and we just don't have enough land area to collect and store enough water. So since independence, Right? Water has always been a strategic uh, priority for the government. And back 50 years ago, when we became independent, we only had three reservoirs uh, in a forested area. But over the last 30, 40 years, what we've done is we've expanded the water catchment in Singapore such that it is now two-thirds of the island. So what is a water catchment? A water catchment means that when the rain falls into the coloured area, the orange and the green, water will drain into one of our 17 reservoirs. The blue areas, the one-third, will go to the sea. Right? So this is an example of really large-scale rainwater harvesting. And the situation was, was pretty bad, pretty dire, just about 40 years ago. Right? This was a condition. Poor public hygiene, uh, filthy rivers, and so on. But what is really heartening is that in one generation, it can be done. Right? And this is a picture of Singapore today. And there was a thought experiment which said that you, if you design your cities well, implement it well, we can actually put the world's population within the size of Texas. Right? And also, when we were about 2 million 40 years ago, life was very very bad, life expectancy was very low. But now that we are, our population has tripled, life is a lot better. So this is the heartening story, all right, that it can be done if we put our minds to it. What you see in front, the water body is actually a drinking water reservoir. And the three pillars and a boat on top is the Marina Bay Sands. So come to Singapore when you get a chance to. Okay, uh, this it's an interesting water cycle diagram. And Singapore is one of the few countries in the world where the entire water loop is managed by one agency. Right? And that's important because this is really large scale systems thinking or systems approach in practice. Because there's a lot of synergy in the different parts of the water loop. Just let me explain. Right? If you were Gordon Feller, and Gordon Feller has been appointed as a director of drainage, right? If you are isolated as just a drainage director, your mission in life is to get rid of water as quickly as it hits the ground. Right? Drainage. You want to drain it away to prevent flooding. But water is such a precious resource. Why do you want to drain it away so quickly? But when you are part of the National Water Agency, your mission changes. Your mission now is not to drain away water, but to collect and store as much as you can. Only when you have an extreme storm and your reservoirs are all full, all right, you know, with a heavy heart, you let the water go. But that changes the way uh, you think about water. And in Singapore, all the rain that comes from heaven belongs to the PUB, belongs to us. Right? You are not allowed to do rainwater harvesting without our permission because we want to manage water at the systems level. Right? So the rain that hits Singapore, two-thirds of it goes to our reservoirs, one-third goes to the sea, and then it goes through then it's treated and it goes to industries and household. And almost every drop of water that we send out, we try to collect back. We collect back and then it's treated before it goes back to the sea. All right? So that's a normal water cycle. But what we did in about 2000, when membrane technology became available, we turned some of this water into what we call new water, which is high-grade recycled water. And new water can now meet 30% of our demand we I mean, use it mainly for industries, and some of it, we put it back into the reservoir during the dry season. We also have desalination. 
So what this means is now in Singapore, we have what we call the four national taps. The first tap on the right is water from local catchment, which is rainwater that we collect. We also have an agreement to import water from Malaysia. Then there's new water and desalinated water. Some insights from here. If you look at Johor water and water from local catchment, they are dependent on the weather. Right? Whereas the other two, new water and desal, are independent of the weather. But they, they require a lot more energy. Right? So we have shifted your reliance on the weather to energy. But as a, as a portfolio, you mix and match. Uh, <coughs> Diesel uses the most energy, about four times, compared to new water. And of course, uh, rainwater takes away about a quarter of what new water takes. All right, so this is a picture of one of our 15 reservoirs, very urbanized. Right? So what it means is where we live is also where we collect our rainwater, our drinking water. So it's important for us to keep the catchments clean. Uh, make sure we don't have pollutive industries within the catchment. Make sure the sewers are not leaking. Make sure that the citizens keep the place clean. Because if you throw rubbish on the streets, it will wash into the drain and it will wash into one of our drinking water reservoirs. <coughs> okay, so my focus today is really on new water, which is high-grade recycled water. All right, is a term that we've given, <coughs> new water. And it is an island-wide project. All right, we have four plants building a fifth, <coughs> and the red lines you see are pipelines that bring water east and west of the island. <coughs> now, the process is something uh, not very innovative, not designed in Singapore. We came to Orange County, we learned what we were doing, we went back, we put it together. These membranes are uh, xenon membranes uh, owned by GE Water now. So it's a three-step process, microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and ultraviolet disinfectant. But really, the engineering is not the difficult part. The difficult part was really to get the community to embrace recycled water. And even before we went out to the community, we had to assure ourselves that recycled water is 100% safe and 100% pure. Right? So we did a lot of tests. We had independent experts to verify these tests. <coughs> yes, and how do we make it simple for the people, for the folks to understand? All right, so if you have a piece of membrane, and <coughs> let me just do this again, right? <coughs> and if you expand it 100 million times, the pores of the membrane is equivalent to the size of a tennis ball. All right? So when you squeeze the water through, the water molecules will get through this membrane. But when you look at the pharmaceuticals, hormones, endocrine disruptors, relative size, size of a football, can't get through. When you look at viruses, even bigger, right? and bacteria, relative size of a building. So we use simple graphics to explain why recycled water is extremely safe. And of course, we had a lot of expert validation to confirm that new water is very safe. And key is stakeholder engagement, right? Three broad groups, the media, the public, and then opinion leaders, <coughs> grassroots leaders, as well as politicians. <coughs> the media played a very important part. We brought them actually to uh, Orange County and Scotts, Scottsdale, Arizona, because they were already doing some form of water recycling. And we helped the media understand how safe water recycling is. And they went back and wrote pieces about it. Uh, we got some stories in, in The Economist, uh, Time Magazine even. So the media played a very important role in our engagement. And we also tried to change some of the words. You know? uh, in Singapore, instead of calling sewage or wastewater, we use the word used water. We think it more accurately defines you know, what it is, the water that we have used, right? We've collected back. Uh, and instead of sewage treatment plants, they are water reclamation plants. Because you're not just treating sewage and putting it out to sea, but you're actually reclaiming it. That's a lot more empowering for the people working in a plant. And of course, in, instead of calling recycled water, we call it new water. Right? And we have a visitor center that we put our kids through. We have had over 1.2 million visitors in the last 10 years or so. Uh, this is really an education center for new water. It's free. If you come to Singapore, 
this is a must visit. OK, I share with you this very interesting uh, story. Uh, you see Secretary, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon there, and the guy on the ground is uh, Prime Minister Lee sen Lung. So what happened was, a couple of years ago, Ban Ki-moon visited the new water visitor center. We showed him around. He was very pleased. Before he left, before he left, his staffers asked us for a few bottles of new water. Yeah, we happily gave it to them. We thought they were going to bring it back to the UN. But that evening, Prime Minister Lee hosted them to a dinner at the, at the palace. Right? And after his speech, it's customary that he drinks a toast to the host nation. And you can see the butler bringing out very fine wine. Uh, and Ban Ki-moon said to the Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, with your permission, can we toast with something better than wine? So Prime Minister was taken aback, you know. There's good Californian wine being served, you know. What is this Ban Ki-moon up to? And from his pocket, he brought out two bottles of new water, and they had a toast and this <coughs> a great PR uh, exercise uh, by the UN. OK, uh, desalination, right? Desalination is important because it gives us the first drop to recycle. Right? Currently, we can meet 25% of our demand with uh, desalination. Okay, so in summary, the principle in play are three principles. One, we try to collect as much as we can every drop of rain that falls. We are two-thirds now. We are trying to increase it. And after we've collected every drop, we try to collect back every drop that is used. And we try to recycle every drop. So in our minds, we don't sell you water. We loan you the water. We loan you the water. You use it. We take it back. We are like a laundry service. I send it back to you. It makes a lot of sense for cities. Then you don't move uh, water you know, over great distances. So we are like a laundry service. All right? uh, and actually, the water that you drink today is the same water that the dinosaurs, the same water that Jesus Christ drank many, many years ago. We don't create new water molecules. What we do is, instead of the natural water cycle taking many, many millions of years, we use science and technology to shortcut the water cycle. That's what what we're doing. OK, I shift a little bit now to, since this is about an urban uh, sustainability uh, get, gathering, uh, we made a major shift in the way we manage our water assets because we have so much water assets that we say hey, we should do something useful with it. So we created a program called the Active, Beautiful, and Clean Waters Program, something that sort of Tom Leader earlier spoke a little bit about. Really, instead of having very ugly utilitarian drains, very efficient to convey water, but not very useful. We create a lot of community space with it. Right? So this is sort of an island-wide project. These are some of the uh, examples. All right? This is a very interesting one. This is a concrete drain due for refurbishment. If we had followed the old mindset, it would have been a bigger drain and a <coughs> deeper drain, but it would look very similar. What we did was we took away the drain and brought back the natural river with a flood plain. All right? And really, the community really loves to come and enjoy uh, these projects. OK, uh, desalination. Right? The key thing about desalination is that it uses a lot of energy. The old way of desalination uses 15 kilowatt hour of energy to turn one meter cube of seawater to fresh water. This is basically boiling, right? the old, old ways. What we are doing now in Singapore and many other countries is to use membranes, viewers, osmosis, and it's now about 3.5 to 4, but not good enough. So in, in uh, reverse osmosis, what you do is you exert a huge pressure to squeeze water through that membrane, right? and that uses a lot of energy. But instead of moving all this water through the membrane, hey, why don't you just pull out the minerals and salts? Right? And that is called electrochemical desalting. Uh, we work with a company, American company, Evoqua. We are building a demonstration plant. We are very confident it will work. So instead of moving so much water through the membrane, what we do is we put an electric field through the membrane, uh, through the water, and we just pull out the salts. So when you move less particles, we use less energy. And we are looking at about 1.5 kilowatt. But really, the holy grail in uh, Desalting or desalination is really to mimic the kidney. Right? The kidney is the most efficient desalting plant in the world. So we are trying to understand how the kidney works. We've got some prototypes 
right? It's a, it's a protein called aquaporin. These are water channels. We have been, the, our universities have been able to synthesize it. It's now really how to engineer it, how to really layer this aquaporin onto the membranes so that it can behave like the kidney. And if we are successful, hopefully 10, 15 years' time, uh, look at the numbers, 0.75 kilowatt. All right, uh, and every two years now, we have a gathering of water experts. We call it the Singapore International Water Week. If you have any interest in water, come to Singapore next year, 10 to 14 of July, uh, one week conference. We have something for everyone. We have a Water Leaders Summit, where you have the ministers and CEOs talking about policy, governance, finance, and so on. We have about 2,000 technical water experts, engineers, scientists talking about water innovation. We have a huge uh, expo, exposition, where buyers and sellers market their products, uh, and there's a business forums, and so on. So if you are really into water and you want to be involved in water, this is uh, the place to be. Right? Once every two years, next year, 10 to 14 of July. OK, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, Gordon said I should say something about the Smart Nation framework. Uh, so I think. Singapore has a vision to be the first smart nation, right? Not smart city, smart nation, because we are a nation and a city. <coughs> and these are some of the areas we are looking in. Uh, for the water sector, what we are doing is we are putting in a lot of sensors into our distribution network so that we can get information on water quality, pressure, flow, and all that. So as the moment there's a leak in a pipeline, we will know before anyone else, then we can go, go down and fix it. <laughs> but all these things that we do, uh, to be a smart nation must be citizen-centric. All right? They must be done to serve the citizens better. So that's the key direction that the government has given us. I've got a couple of folks here from the Infocom Development Authority of Singapore. Uh, they are helping to build that backbone for communication and uh, nationwide uh, sensor networks, trying to put the backbone in place so that uh, the other components can, can fit in. Um, just give you one example of how useful data is. Right? In Singapore, there are two big cap companies, one yellow cap and one blue cap. They collected the past five years' data on accidents. So they studied the data, eh, and they found that there were more accidents involving the blue caps. They studied further, they found that most of the accidents or more of the accidents happened in the night. So they came to a conclusion that actually, and, and the cap caps were all randomized and, and you know, same, same uh, brands and so on. So the only reason that they could think of why the yellow caps had less accidents is because it's brighter. Right? So the blue cap company is trying to see how they can make their caps more visible in the night. Right? So this is one example where if you have enough data and if you look at it in a clever way, you are able to tease out insights that will be extremely useful for the community. Okay, I'm just about, yeah. All right, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> thank you, George. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> well, one of the questions that kept coming up, both on my personal email and through the Twitter feed, which we're going to get to this afternoon, and it's something I want you to maybe say a minute or two about, is the, the challenge to finance this. Is, is it... Is the magic formula in Singapore that the citizens believe that this is vital to the success of the country and a national security priority because you don't want to be dependent on the other two taps that you showed us? Is that the basis for having the tax policy that makes the infrastructure financing possible, that makes new water happen? Okay, um, water has always been on the strategic agenda of the government, right? So in that sense, it made financing a lot simpler because the government is very clear that without a secured, reliable supply of water in Singapore, businesses will not come to Singapore and your population cannot grow as, as it is. So it is sort of top of priority, so we get uh, a bigger piece of the pie, we want to see, you know? So, Finance is not a big issue, but we are also doing what we call PPP projects. All right, we've got about four PPP projects where we want to develop the water industry. So we allow the industry to bid, to operate, build, operate, and own, and we just buy 
water from them. So the examples are the two diesel plants. They are all PPP contracts. We just buy water from them. And it's been hugely successful because the companies want to get track record working in Singapore because PUB has a fairly good brand name elsewhere. So if they had worked in PUB, they can get jobs in China and the Middle East and so on. So it's sort of a win-win for, for both sides. Right? Well, at 2.50 this afternoon, we're going to have a session with Chris Hamill from RBC Capital Markets about PPPs, about are they viable, are they financeable. Uh, and then at 5.30, we're going to have an opportunity to drink uh, new beer that's right. based on new water. Great. Okay. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.